the Kanemitsu show, which you see around you, is featuring work that is created over the course of a four-decade exploration of mark making and abstraction. In this gallery, we're focused on his extraordinary paintings, both on paper and canvas, and unusually drawings as well. And we made a deliberate decision not to show the lithographs, which are, are most familiar to people, because um, we were really excited about this incredible body of work that not many people have seen. So by way of brief introduction to Kenimitsu as an artist and a, and a person, he was born in Utah in 1922 and was a Kibe, which means he's a Japanese American born in the US but raised in Japan and then returned to the US. He came back as a young adult, enlisting in the army just months before Pearl Harbor, and he uh, was sent into, subsequently sent into an army prison where he began to paint and draw using um, Red Cross donated supplies. And previously he had considered himself a poet which is kind of interesting if you um, read things that he's written and um, you know, kind of hear him talk about his work. It's really quite, quite wonderful. Um, like many, including Ed Clark, um, whose work you can see next door, he ultimately spent time in Europe painting and studying, um, returning to the US to um, study in New York and Baltimore. He was a um, student of uh, Kuniyoshi at the Art Student League. Art Students League, and then he fell into a group of abstract expressionists that were hanging around the Cedar Bar and were, um, I'm sure, a, a great gravitational force. So he um, started experimenting in abstraction and um, came up with a sort of uh, a signature style that you see around you. Um, he uh, exhibited his paintings widely in New York and finally came to LA in the early 60s to do um, uh, and on a fellowship um, for, to uh, work with June Wayne at the Tamarind Workshop. Um, he found really incredible opportunities here teaching and working, so he stayed. And he taught at Chouinard from 1965 to 1970 and at the um, Otis School of Art from 1971 to 1983, influencing generations of artists in LA. Um, and today we are fortunate to have with us two artists who were students of Kenimitsu in those early years after his arrival from New York, um, Laddie John Dill and Hirokazu Kosaka. Um, I'll introduce the two of them and uh, give sort of brief, um, brief bios on each of them, uh, although um, they probably don't need too much of an introdu introduction. Um, but, uh, and then we'll have a conversation and then open it up to the audience. Um, so I'll start first with Laddie John Dill, who is a Los Angeles native, born in Long Beach and attended Santa Monica High School. He graduated from Chouinard in 1968. And at the age of 28, Dill had his first one-man exhibition at the Ileana Sonnabend Gallery in New York. Dill's list of exhibitions includes galleries and museums from Seoul, Paris, Nagoya, and Helsinki to New York, Kansas City, Seattle, and throughout Northern and Southern California. Um, he is the recipient of two NEA grants, one for sculpture and one for painting, and he is a Guggenheim uh, Fellow in, in painting. He's taught extensively at UCLA, UC Irvine, Art Center in Pasadena, and lectured in numerous universities and art institutions across the United States. And Hirokazu Kosaka, here to my left, was born in Japan and came to Los Angeles in 1958. He has a BFA from Chouinard Art Institute and a Master of Arts in Theology from Columbia University. He is an ordained Buddhist priest, a Master of the Japanese Art of Archery, and the Visual Arts Director at the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center in Little Tokyo. Recent exhibitions include Ruin Map at the JACCC Gallery, on the Veranda at Pomona College Museum of Art in 2013, and a major commissioned performance, Kalpa, at the Getty Center in Los Angeles in 2012, which inaugurated the Pacific Standard Time Performance and Public Art Festival. He's been widely supported by foundations such as Creative Capital and the Rockefeller Foundation, and has residencies, um, has held residencies around the world. So um, welcome to both of you. Um, and I think we can just kind of start in um, talking about your experiences um, as, with Kenimitsu as a as a teacher. So how did you how did you first meet him and, and um, where? So 
Well, I attended Chouinard between, as, as you said, between 64 and 68. So um, I probably, ha I, I took um, um, my Kanemitsu's class whenever it was available and uh, at least six or seven times. Um, I, I liked the way he, just the way the atmosphere of the room was. Uh, there were a lot, quite a few artists that are working today that worked with Mike. Um, he had an interesting <coughs> style of teaching. Um, it, it, he worked with a figure, and uh, you, it wasn't mandatory that you that you work with the figure. The, uh, she she posed, uh, but she was also, in in, in some cases, a muse. Uh, and uh, it, it set up a kind of a formal uh, atmosphere. And Mike, um, if you don't mind if I call him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, had a very definite way of setting up the class where he, he set up his own easel um, a few feet from the model. And uh, as I remember it, he was always there uh, in the class first drawing from the model. And then uh, students would come in and they'd always be behind him. And uh, if he never got up and walked around the class and looked at someone's work and uh, commented on it, if you had some kind of question that um, you uh, wanted answered, you came to him. So, and he, he continued to work, and pretty much you, you understood that the model was really modeling for him. He had a very interesting intimacy, uh, visually, with the model. So she, he would, and, and, and everyone in that, in that classroom really picked up on that pretty quickly. So at first it was a little awkward because uh, nobody had the guts to walk up to him and say, hey, do you want to see these drawings I just did. You know. <laughs> this is kind of a them and us kind of thing, you know. Um, but that broke down pretty quickly. And um, Mike spoke very little. I mean, uh, his English was, was uh, fairly limited, as, as I remember. <laughs> I, and obviously, I don't speak Japanese, so. Um, but very friendly, very warm guy. Um, and the classroom, if you, if you, you know, Chenard was the old, uh, was an old building that had been painted white so many times that it started to take on a kind of a sculptural texture to it. Um, and you walk into the room and there's Mike and, and then the model and uh, then everybody spread out doing their own thing. And, uh, I remember characters like Gary Wong and um, David Deutsch, and um, I don't know if you'd know those names or not, but uh, they were in the class, and uh, they're, they're still working today. Uh, anyway, uh, he started to take uh, an interest in my work, um, and we, we started to become personal friends. And then he, uh, he said, uh, he would tell me th really funny things like, uh, you have to be, in, in his language, I mean in his, his accent, um, you have to learn to be a social butterfly if you really want to, you know, get somewhere in New York. You know? And, uh, you know, like, meaning, very sarcastic. Um, <coughs> But then he, uh, he saw some drawings of mine that I did in his class, obviously. And um, he said, would you like to do an exhibition in San Francisco? Well, I mean, I was green as hell, you know, so uh, I'd never shown anything. And um, so he got me this uh, show in a, a Japanese gallery mm -hmm. um, in, in the Japanese district of, of San Francisco. And um, we had an opening, and uh, he, I sort of just 
did whatever he did, you know. I mean, he, sh he showed as well. And uh, then uh, the reality of it all really struck me because I actually did sell a couple of things. I don't know how much they were, like $250 or something like that. And uh, then he uh, uh, took half the money. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, I, and that, uh, that was my first taste of uh, the reality of the art world. <laughs> um, and they still take half your money, by the way, <laughs> and do less. Um, but anyway, Mike uh, was, became very personable. Uh, I, I knew his daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew his wife at the time. Um, and he just kind of allowed me into his world, which was, uh, imagine just getting a, if you didn't know him, you'd get this little peek hole to see what he was like, you know. But once you were, got to know him or hung with him a little bit, he really uh, had a, a massively gigantic world, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, uh, his mark making, his, his experimentation and everything. And he was never shy about that. I think if I, uh, if I had to have one thing to say about him is how he, he was just like naked out there. I mean, he would just do his work right there in the classroom, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's where we really learned. I mean, watching him and then uh, not copying him or anything like that, but just, just having the guts to do that. You know, I, I don't know how many teachers I've had where, you know, you never know what they do, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but he was just like wide open and uh, was just one of us. There was a real intimacy about it. Mm -hmm. you know, That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Hirokazu? I came to uh, Shinar Art Institute in 1966 mm -hmm. and graduated in 1970. And uh, I just arrived from Japan, and I, I didn't really speak English well. So uh, there were two uh, Japanese teachers. It was uh, Mike Kanemitsu and Nob Hadeishi, who was also teaching. And so I, uh, any problem with the language, uh, the administration told me to go to uh, Mike Kanemitsu. So I did, and that was like first week of the, mm. my uh, class. And he really accepted me. Uh, I think he sort of viewed as when he was young mm -hmm. with the language problem, things, things like that. So first day, he took me to his uh, home, and uh, dinner was served. <laughs> and later on, I, I really... Uh, he hired me to do his canvas and clean his studio, things like that. And then in a couple of uh, exhibitions that he had, I think uh, Margot Levin's uh, first show was at his, uh, her house in some place in Melrose, I can't remember. But we hung, I hung to his show. But mm -hmm. I think- Melrose in Los Angeles. Some place there, yeah. And it was someone's, it's like a home, right? Yeah, so I, I helped install the exhibition. This is like 1967 or something like that. And uh, again, I, I didn't really speak English too well, but uh, he helped me about uh, a lot uh, on studio. And also, I think we spoke in Japanese. And I think he was craving for a young Japanese uh, almost like a information. Mm. And I just you know, arrived from Kyoto, uh, sort of ancient capital of Japan. So he was craving for that kind of uh, uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. And also I brought him story of Gutai group in Osaka because I, I also have uh, sort of uncles and friends who were in Gutai group, mm. and especially Mr. Uh, Murakami Saburo, and I think you've seen it here at MOCA, mm -hmm. the first entrance of the, the paper that uh, Paul Schumo went through. Yeah. I, in fact, <laughs> I made that, <laughs> because I, I'm the resource of good type 
here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, he passed away, but this kind of uh, information, mm -hmm. uh, Gutai people, uh, Murakami, Shimamoto, uh, Shiraga, all those people were uh, not friends, but uh, mentor of, of my, my uh, mm -hmm. sort of art education. So when I arrived in the Shinard, uh, my first class was Watson Cross, the figure drawing teacher. Uh, he, had, he was incredibly uh, handicapped. He, had, uh, he was always in, seated, but incredible anatomical person. And big head with big arms. And uh, he, he was sort of a first teacher that I had. Uh, Gibson, remember Herb Gibson was there. Uh, I, I became a good friend with uh, Joe Funk, who was a printmaker downstairs. And then again, Fred Tamsley was my uh, uh, color and design teacher. And throughout my, my four year, uh, Mike really helped me uh, financially also too. And I became a good friend with uh, other students there. Uh, I think like Bill Levitt who's sitting in the back. He, we became good friends. Al Ruppersberg was my, uh, I, I took a, a student work and he was my boss. And it was mm -hmm. a janitorial group. Uh, so Al was my boss and then Jack Goldstein was part of the student work and Jack and I became good friends and uh, we uh, really uh, shared studio together. So uh, I don't know if you remember Ron Cooper's old studio. It's present time, it's a convention center now. But Ron Cooper had a, almost 10,000 square foot of a studio and Jack and I, we shared together and it was $100 a month. <laughs> which is 10,000 square feet. It was an wow. incredible space. I think it was a, I think it was a coffin. Um, downstairs? Yeah, it was a coffin mm -hmm. store. Yeah, downstairs. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, when we, Jack and I, we uh, formed Ghosting Kosaka Frame Shop, JK Frame, and we did a lot of uh, frames for Mike. Mm -hmm. And uh, those plexiglass frame that was very popular at that time. Oh. We did, uh, oh God, we, we uh, the entire city, we did most of the framing. Mm -hmm. I think most, my enjoyable one was Edward Keynote, Keynote Studio, going there and picking up some artwork and framing them. So those are the kind of encounter mm -hmm. from uh, 1962, around 72. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. It sounds like, I mean, he's more, really more than a teacher. He kind of opened his sure, yeah. kind of universes and, and worlds to, to you all. Well, yeah, he also really generous, yeah. had some um, incredibly terrible things happen to him. Mm -hmm. You know, like uh, he had, uh, what, two children? Mm -hmm. Two daughters. Yes. Two right? daughters and a son. And his wife just split on him. Yeah. And uh, he had these two kids. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, he raised them. He didn't complain about it or anything like that. They were little, too. And uh, just continued to do his work and, and do his teaching and raise his kids. And I, I, I really admired him for that. You know, like, he, he sort of opened up to me a little bit. And uh, he goes, uh, I, I think his wife's name was Carol, right? Um, I said, so how's Carol doing? And uh, she left. <laughs> I said, really, are the girls okay? And he goes, yeah, they're okay, they're with me. And that, and that was it, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I never mentioned it again and just continued to just work. I mean, he was a um, very strong-willed guy, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, you know, I, I remember, you know you have the same haircut that he had. <laughs> yeah. Do you know that? Yeah. I did it especially for <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I look at you, it reminds me of Mike. It's kind of the salt and pepper yeah. thing too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so my, my memories of Mike were mainly 
your hair and then <laughs> and his back uh -huh. and then walk up to him and go I, I uh, what do you think of this I got a problem with this you know uh -huh. and he would just like in a couple of words you know just kind of uh, allow you into his his world like that mm -hmm. and then then he wouldn't say anything and then when this San Francisco thing came up that I mentioned he, it, it wasn't like he built up to it or anything. He just came up and announced it, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you just kind of go, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> um, so it was a really interesting experience. Um, go, Chouinard was an interesting mm -hmm. experience. I mean, he was the epitome of Chouinard. Yeah. Very different than CalArts. There's no resemblance to CalArts, actually. Um, it, uh, I actually was going to go to Arts Center, mm -hmm. and um, I remember this. Uh, I was in, I was going I was going to Arts Center actually, and I was in this drawing class, and uh, the uh, instructor came up to me and said, "We don't draw this way here," and uh, I so I right there I just said, "I think I'm out of here," you know? mm -hmm. and. Uh, then I had a, a little bit of a problem with the draft. Uh, the Vietnam War was going on, and uh, so I split for a while. And, uh, and then, then I got out of the draft, and uh, I happened to be downtown, so I went over to Chenard. That's how I got to know mm -hmm. Chenard. And uh, there were guys like Boyd Elder and um, uh, let's see who else was around there. Um, a lot of the ceramic people, mm -hmm. um, which was the whole world in itself, Elsa Rady, people like that. And uh, I just said, wow, I'm home, you know. And yeah. I uh, immediately signed up. And um, it, I don't, they don't, you know, you had to go through the whole routine with them and uh, to get in. And I think at that time, they, it was a fairly serious thing if you got in, and then mm -hmm. you, you had to stay in, you know? Yeah. And uh, it was hard to stay in, too. But it was always, uh, it was very subtle, um, very, very different than our art center, very different from UCLA, which I ended up teaching at for 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was... What was so different about it? Did well, it first of all, UCLA is a city-state in itself, mm -hmm. you know, and it uh, uh, it had it had criterias for painting. Mm -hmm. You know, it had um, you know you could always you could always tell a UCLA student um, they had a certain kind of color sensibility, and a certain way of laying down the paint and all that. You know, I mean, I teach now at Otis, and I. I I'll tell us, you know, I say, hey, you know, they're knocking them out at UCLA over there. You don't have to do it here. <laughs> so, uh, an art center was basically a training school at that time. I mean, they didn't have Mike Kelly teaching over there, you know. It was a completely different place. In fact, it was on 3rd Street in uh, Han Hancock Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought about Otis, but then I, I but once I got to Chenard, I really felt at home. And uh, the hierarchy, there was no hierarchical situation. I think that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to point. I'm trying to get across is that it, uh, the teachers were all artists, and uh, from Emerson Wolfer, who I took quite a bit, um, to uh, uh, Mike. And so without that hierarchical system like that, it was really great. Mm -hmm. There was another guy there, Don Graham, did you ever take him? Mm -hmm. you know? And he'd show you all these tricks, you know, that, um, which I swear to God, I, I still use. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll show you this trick, and he'd do it on chalkboard, you know, and he'd always wear a smock, gray smock. You know? and, um, it, it was a real experience. I mean, I, 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 once I got there, I never left mm -hmm. until I graduated, you know. Then I forgot to pick up my, my um, diploma because they didn't have graduations. 
that I remember, and um, or I was I missed it or something, and uh, it said Cal Arts on it, and I said, well, I didn't go to Cal Arts, you know, so uh, I don't know if they. I think they reprinted them for people who had graduated from Chenard. Mm -hmm. But I was very, very proud, and still am very proud of, that I went to Chenard mm -hmm. and, and studied under people like Mike Konmitsu and Emerson mm -hmm. Wolfer and um, right. Graham and those guys. Was your experience at Chenard similar? Did you have that? Yeah, I think uh, it was a bit different and uh, yeah. lot of, uh, my the period I, I went, uh, Chuck Arnotti, Tom Udo, and your brother Guy were there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I was, I'm coming from a very traditional mm -hmm. uh, Japanese uh, Kyoto city. I, I was raised, uh, my home is 800 years old. My, it's a monastery. <laughs> and I, uh, I remember I, I need to write a art, art, art history class with uh, Julius Langsner. Langsner was a writer for LA Times. And so I wrote about the difference between uh, Western art and the Japanese art. And I mentioned uh, the dates of uh, Last Supper by Da Vinci. And it was finished in 1495. And in Kyoto, if you ever go to uh, Dioanji Temple, there's 15 rocks and pe only pebbles. And that was finished in 1450. And I sort of mentioned to Langsner that it was not, uh, I think I, I, I quoted someone, it's Western paintings tells me who they are. But when you look at the Dioanji Temple with rocks and pebbles, it tells me who I am. And he gave me an A plus on that. <laughs> and he called me in and, you know, I didn't speak English well, uh -huh. but uh, I told him about Gutai group. And he was just really fascinated mm -hmm. because Alan Capital had uh, came up with his happening book within inserts of Gutai people. And I said, well, I knew these guys. <laughs> and so he, uh, I don't know, he asked me to take his classes, and he invited me to his home. I think it was in Silver Lake someplace, and uh, he mm -hmm. wanted me to, to show him photographs of Kutai people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it was a uh, very different way of, the education was so different. Uh, mm -hmm. I came first day looking like this, with suit on it, I still do. <laughs> 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 I work at the Japanese American Culture Center, I'm director, so, this is my uniform in a way, but it, in tradition of my home, it was black and white robes, that's all I wore. Mm -hmm. And when I came to Chenard, people were wearing uh, jeans. And Mike, too, had a jeans on. And so I had to go buy jeans. <laughs> and I think it was a Pennies and, and Sears on, on downtown here. <laughs> and so I need, to, you know, the attire became very different and how you approach. I think I remember calling Kanemitsu Sensei, you know, and he stopped me and says, you know, call me Mike, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was very hard to, to have that transition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's in Japan, it's very honorific to teach, uh, speak to the teacher mm -hmm. in a, a very, uh, well, it's a formal way, right. but later, uh, we became good friends, and it became uh, a very a slang, mm -hmm. even Japanese and English. So we were kind of a mixture of that. So uh, I was introduced to uh, American lifestyle, as you said. Mm -hmm. The um, I think my first impact uh, in the hist in the four year of my Shinarda was. Uh, a Vietnam War, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the people were getting drafted. And a friend of mine at Shinardi, he was drafted. And so... Yeah, art school didn't get you out of the draft. That's right. Mm -hmm. I think the, the latter part of the 70s, I think you, get, you could get drafted while you're going to college. Mm -hmm. Latter part of the 60s. Yeah. And I, 
I had a, a, a visa, student visa, so I, I was able to go back to Japan, but um, the one five o'clock news on all the channels were showing the Vietnam War. And uh, the last image that I saw of the Vietnam War was this a Buddhist monk just pour mm -hmm. gasoline over his, uh, I think it was in Saigon, yeah. and he just burned himself with incredible gesture of this particular meditation. <coughs> and that really uh, kind of, a, I don't know, changed my life. Mm -hmm. And this was in the 1968, uh, around there. So with that said, uh, Mr. Murakami's and Gutai group, that influenced me to do a particular genre called body art. Mm -hmm. And I think in 1972, we, uh, myself, uh, Chris Burden, and Wolfgang Stoko, we did a performance at Pomona, Pomona mm -hmm. College. And that sort of a, was, uh, I think, uh, a venture that I took for uh, last n next five years or so. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go back, you know, looking at that Vietnam uh, news clips. I need to go back to my monastery. So after graduation, I, I went back to Japan and uh, became a full ordained Buddhist priest. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you, you were in Japan for a while. You did yeah, an about incredible, five years, incredible piece. That, well, I, uh, again, Gutai people asked me to do a before going to monastery uh, to do a performance, so Mr. Murakami's uh, <coughs> a gallery space, I did a piece called Soriades. And Soriades is a flamenco uh, music. And I, I, uh, when I was 14, I, I lived in Sevilla, learning how to play flamenco guitar. Mm -hmm. So I knew the couple pieces from uh, flamenco repertoire. Soriades, Bolerias, Alegrias, Talantas, Talantos, all those. I, I learned Spanish in my teens, so I did a piece called uh, Soriades in this gallery. I played a long piece, and then I, I had a, a razor blade on my index finger, and it was pouring onto this white paper. And then uh, I packed my guitar and went to Shikoku Island, and I started walking. It's called the Pilgrimage of 88 Temple. It's a thousand mile walk. Uh, gypsies were nomadic people, and this sort of signified the walking part. And the, the soliaris and the blood, it, the corida, corida is a, uh, corida is a uh, bullfight ring with all the blood. I, if you've ever seen uh, bullfight, the entire stadium become red. And that was the uh, piece. And by the time, a couple of weeks later, when I'm walking, it just, uh, it was not art, but it was spiritual kind of walking. And it took me three months to walk this thousand miles. When I came back, I was ordained, and uh, art was not in my mm -hmm. mind. So that was yeah, a piece yeah. that, that was the last performance <laughs> I did uh, mm -hmm. in that period. It's amazing. And then you, you came back to the States. Yeah, I came back because uh, they, the headquarter of this, mm -hmm. this particular Buddhist sect, they, they knew me, and they, uh, I, since I spoke English and bilingual, they asked me to be a minister at one of the <coughs> local temples here mm -hmm. in Little Tokyo. So in 1976, 77, uh, I came back as mm -hmm. a minister here. And I lived in the, one of the temples here for a oh. few years, yeah. And did they make you, you swim back to the mainland? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a Buddhist sect called Shingon sect. It's a tantric form. It's, uh, it's ninth century Buddhism. And uh, again, our temple, my headquarters is in uh, Mankoya, but uh, my own temple is in Shikoku Island. And it's quite famous now because the, the Dalai Lama come and visit us every year. So it's mm -hmm. Did Mike have any uh, uh, connection with, with Zen Buddhists? Yeah, I think I, we talked uh, long uh, nights on mm -hmm. Buddhism. I had a young 
uh, kind of a, a view about Zen Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And around that time, you know, a very, uh, not just uh, arts, but poems like uh, Gary Snyder, Allen Ginsberg, John Cage, Alan Watts were doing a lot of kind of a Zen talk, hippie mm -hmm. Zen talk. <laughs> and I kind of intervened because I, I did the discipline. I, did, I, I knew the resource. And so I think Mike uh, wanted to know more about this doctrine. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, what is Prajna Paramita Sutra, for example? And uh, my background was on Sanskrit, so lots of Sanskrit work came, came in. And I think I taught them, you know, there's a Japanese word for baka, stupid. And baka is not a Japanese word, but it's Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. And lots of uh, words in our English language is too, is uh, shared with uh, Sanskrit. Even la, love, you know, I love you, love is shared with uh, Sanskrit called lavalita. So, you know, that's kind of stuff. I think we, uh, Mike and I, uh, we share those kind of sentiment. Mm -hmm. And I, I was only 19, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. But he, he uh, I really uh, was a mentor in, in a way. And, and the Buddhism came, uh, uh, you know, conversation of Buddhism came a, a lot not just Zen Buddhism. Right. I mean, that time, you know, Zen was very flourishing in America, but I mean, Shingon sect, Pure Land sect, Nichiren sect, all that is a very uh, diverse Japanese uh, denomination. Mm -hmm. Even today, I don't think a lot of many people know about Shingon sect. You know, it's a very tantric form of uh, very ancient uh, Japan. And if you go to Japan, like Nara Prefecture, or Kyoto, you'll see an incredible, uh, uh, this denominational kind of uh, uh, temples. The edifice is very different than Zen Buddhism. So I think I brought that mm -hmm. to the table, to the conversation. I think, you know? yeah. yeah. Very interesting. I just, I, I've heard from a few people about these sort of like late night kind of <laughs> late night sessions, drinking beer, like lots of conversation. It just seems like that, that was the kind of, you know, role that he played for a lot of people and is sort of a, uh, someone who gathered and mm -hmm. kind of brought people together and, and was almost like an, uh, I don't know, something that uh, held, held an orbit or something like that. I think so, is, yeah. was that. Would that be sort of accurate? A social butterfly. A social butterfly, <laughs> exactly. That's his favorite term. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.